Um, narcissism. <laughs> I just like to be in my shoes right now. Um, because we're going to go into narcissism, but more so in a little bit of the subsets of narcissism. <clears throat> in, the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the process, I'm probably going to create a little introspection. I'll probably tweak a few personal sensitivities. But when I did my first service here, I made a slight mistake. I, I got up and apologized a little ahead of time, just in case. And Dillman, who you know, is an ordained minister, um, and sometimes subtle as a train wreck, came up to me afterwards and said, you never, ever apologize during or before a sermon. So I've learned my lesson. So if I tweak some sensitivities, I'll do all my mea culpas in the social hour later. Okay. Let me be a little specific about where we're going here. Narcissism, yes. More so, trickle down. Egocentrism, yes. It's all about me. More and more, yes, it's about me very much, yes. Starting with narcissism, um, the way to look at it is we're going to start over here with narcissism and get down to it's about me. It's kind of like saying we're going from bipolar to mood swings almost, you know. Narcissism is a recognized personality disorder, uh, especially in the last 30 years. And about 1% of the public out there is being treated for narcissism. Mental health specialists think about 16% should be treated. It's growing very significantly over the last 30 years. And they measure the growth of narcissism by, it's actually a narcissistic personality inventory, which I have copies of when we leave here if you want them. Uh, just kidding. Series of, uh, and it's just a series of paired questions which tevils, uh, determines your level of, of narcissism. As we define narcissism, it's kind of attention-seeking, superficial charming, sense of entitlement, impaired empathy, and as they define impaired empathy, uh, impaired ability to recognize or identify with the needs of others. Compassion, okay? Narcissism by itself is not a problem until it affects others, family, friends, and in some cases, because of the growth of narcissism, We've seen significant increases in crime, specifically against homeless, gay, lesbian, transgender, immigrants. Sorry, guys, a little dry. Our concern here today is more as it comes down to the, like the fourth subset, which is it's about me. I'm going to relate a little story here. It, it's poignant. It's poignant. It's personal. But I think it's a good segue where we're going. About six years ago, um, and Debbie, I think, is going to answer a question that came up at our meeting the other day, by the way. About six years ago, my mom was dying, and we were waiting for the phone call, and came in on a Tuesday morning about 5 a.m., and afterwards, <clears throat> Barbara said to me, what are, you, what are you going to do? I said, well, to be honest with you, there's not much I can do at this point. I said, it's early in the morning. For many of you know, I'm, I'm a, a reinvented as a personal trainer. I said, I, I might as well just go into work for a few hours, and then we'll figure out what's going on. So I got up and I went into work, and needless to say, I was not on my game. You know, I'm supposed to be Mr. Bubbly, Mr. Happy, you know, this kind of thing. And I wasn't. And the first few people came in, and I have wonderful clients. I, I love them dearly. And they came in, and they noticed that I just didn't have it. And they said, geez, Ed, what's the matter? And I said, well, you know, my mom passed away early this morning. The response was fairly standard and one that I think most of us expect to a degree. It was, gee, I, I know how you feel because when, I know when my mom passed away. Or I know how you feel. I know when my dad passed away, how I felt. And I think that's a fairly standard way to react. I think there's a better approach that might have been done. Um, and I, when I discuss this with people, including Reverend Terry afterwards, she said, well, that's, that's because people don't know what to say at a time like that. That's a typical reaction is to try and bring things back to yourself because it's so difficult what to say. And I'm going to suggest to you that there is something you could say, or in this case, not say. 
you don't say anything. What you might want to do, and in retrospect, might have helped me a little bit more in my grief and help anybody else in that situation, ask me questions. I wouldn't have shared with you that what happened if I didn't want to talk about it. I would have just told you I had a stomach ache or something. But ask me some questions. Ask me how old my mom was. Where does she live? How's my dad doing? Do you have any children, uh, sisters and brothers? What's your plans? Because it was about me at that point in time, and I didn't want it particularly to be about you. And it's a great way to handle it. And I hope that answers your question. So moving on, hold that thought. The fact is that psychologists and sociologists agree more and more. We're getting more and more. As narcissism increases, it's getting all about me and our society. And if it's all about me, it can't be all about you, simply put, because there's only so much time in our lives. And that has a tendency to impact our values and love, caring, compassion. And it's made a dramatic change in the last three, day, uh, three decades. One of the most dramatic factors that's occurred, and you know I'm going to go here, is media content, personal interaction has changed dramatically. And it's in cities change. It isn't we just woke up one morning. I'm sorry, bad habit. And we woke up one morning and just said, oh, wow, you know, it's, it's, it, it, everything's changed out there. If you look back to 1994, we had 25 million Internet users. In 04, we have 910 million. 2014, we have 2.9 billion. That's only 40% of our global population that it's changing the way they're interacting. Every minute of every day, we generate 204 million emails. Imagine if the post office had that, they'd be bigger than Walmart at this point. We don't shop anymore. Every minute of every day, we stay home and we don't interact. But we spend every minute $272,000 a minute just over the internet. And survey said that 62% of the people who have iPhones, the first thing they do upon getting out of bed is they immediately grab that iPhone. Let me tell you, they got to have better bladders than I got, okay? Because <laughs> that ain't the first thing, all right? It's creating some societal disorders, speed of communications, boredom, frustration, lack of patience. And if we drill down, one big factor, I hate to say it, guys. Facebook. We all know it. It's an all about me medium. Look at me. I get up this morning. I brush my teeth. I wash my hair. I got the kids out. I took a shower, so on. And here's pictures of everything I've done, by the way, except the shower deal. Okay? About six years ago, I um, decided I would get on Facebook. Oh, okay. Not bad. And I had friends coming out of the woodwork all the way back to the cold potty, I think. And I, I wasn't comfortable with it after about 30 days. And I put a posting on there. I said, I'm just not comfortable. But to all you people who have just come back as my friends, here's my phone number. Here's my email address. Talk to me. Not one person contacted me ever. Talk about texting. I have to tell this story. It's about my daughter. I know she's going to watch the rerun on this, so Adrian, I love you like a rock, sweetie, when you see this. But she said to me one day, Dad, you've got to start texting me. I said, Honey, why do I have to do that? She says, Well, so I don't have to talk to you. <laughs> what did our link letter said about kids do the, say this, you know, whatever. I've had people over for dinner and been out with people for dinner, and they're looking down at their laps as they're eating dinner. And at my age, you kind of think maybe they got a little problem. No, they, they're reading their emails while we're having dinner. And here it comes. I've sat in this congregation and watched people texting on email. And you know who you are. I'm not going to point you out, okay? Selfies. We're into selfies. Now they're on polls. So you can hold it out and say, hey, here's a picture of Niagara Falls with me in front of it, you know? And it's not only that. Behavioral scientists have agreed reality TV is another big culprit. 
Because on reality TV, we're taking an average person who feels deserving of fame, but they haven't gone through any talent and hard work to get there. And a study in 13 said people who watch voyeuristic and competitive reality shows have higher levels of narcissism compared to those that watch non or educational reality. Plastic surgery has gone up by a factor of six in just the last 10 years. Um, music analysis of lyrics. We're now using much more I and me in lyrics than we are we and us. And here's one I kind of caught yesterday on the way out. You can now hire a fake paparazzi to follow you around. So, <laughs> so when you go out, people think you're somebody famous. I swear, I, I couldn't make this stuff up, guys. Trust me, all right? And where would we be without religion, which has evolved? Not in the message, but in the way it's delivered. Now it's delivered so much more in mega churches. Mega churches defined by having over 2,000 members. In 1970, there were 50 mega churches. Now there's over 2,000 mega churches out there. And as I said, it's not the message, but it's the identifiably narcissistic religious leaders sometimes that are on occasion leading these churches. And in some cases, leading congregations into dangerous areas. Waco, British Guiana, we all know that. And you have ministers now that people are looking up to that have huge homes, they have airplanes, they have expensive cars. And for the record, for you new folks, our standing minister drives an ancient CRV with 200,000 miles on it. So. <laughs> and it's actually becoming recognized by some leaders of the church. Pope Francis, great guy. He, simple white robe, he drives a Ford Focus, Focus CRV, close, carries his own luggage, sits in a wooden chair instead of a papal throne. And he was the first pope to openly recognize narcissism in the church. During an interview, he made a statement about the Roman Curia, and the Curia is the Roman court, or, uh, the governing body of, of the Catholic Church. He said, quote, heads of the church have often been narcissists, Flattered and thrilled by their courtiers, the court is the leprosy of the papacy. Heavy statement. Well, let's go to part two, because part two, if you look at what's written up there, is chaos in society. And how it's affecting our inner selves, recognizably affecting our inner selves. If some of you can go back with me to 1966, you might remember the Texas Bell Tower. A fellow by Charles Whitman went up. Tower, UT Austin, he killed 16 people. That was the front page for weeks and weeks and weeks. Today, 2,000 people just died in Nigeria. And this is ongoing. We're exposed to this every single day. What happened in France, and on and on. And what's happening is we're seeing more and more hurt, poverty, war, violence, terrorism. And it kind of desensitizes us. It helps, it really, we build walls. And it prevents us sometimes from understanding the true horrors of human suffering. It's a little bit like a soldier on a battlefield. Soldier goes out, he shields himself from his emotions, because if he doesn't shield himself from his emotions, he can't do his job. Okay? He protects himself. Well, more and more, they're finding people subconsciously protecting themselves because of the information that's flowing to them about these horrors on a daily basis. Soldiers come back with PTSD. It's thought that maybe people, when it relates to compassion, starting to build a very, very mild form of their own PSTD for personal situations today. Okay, so that's all the bad news. All right, Ed, where's the good news? How do we react to this and how can we contend with it? Well, as far as chaos in society, it, it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. And the only thing we can do about it is to have an awareness that we may be building walls up within ourselves. We may be inuring ourselves. And in times of compassion, we have to realize that we have to try and make sure those walls drop down a little bit. About me, that's a little tougher one. 
You could all go out for cognitive behavior therapy and pay a lot of money and focus on reaching out, but that's a little silly. We wouldn't want to do that. I'm going to just mention a simple technique that I learned from necessity. Again, a little short story, because it's about me right now, let's face it, you know. As long as I got the mic, okay. Here I am in 1968, newly married, okay, very newly married with a child on the way. And the next service I'm doing is on birth control, by the way. Um, edit that too, please. Um, and I have a, almost a degree in sociology, and I'm looking like, oh, I'm going to go out and be a social worker and take a vow of poverty, okay? Or I can go over here, like a lot of my friends are doing, and I can go into sales and make some money, which I need very desperately. Now, in my 11 years of undergraduate full-time work, um, trying to get a degree, I didn't have one business course, one marketing course, nothing. I knew nothing about business sales or anything. So I did what kind of made sense. I jumped on every sales course I could possibly jump on. Tommy Hopkins, Zig Ziglar, Carnegie, all of them. And the one thing I learned in the first year, which is so paramount to, fortunately, my success, was that people do not buy products, they buy people. And if you can't sell yourself and establish a relationship with somebody out there, you can have the best product in the whole wide world. It ain't gonna sell. And you can have a good product and a great relationship, and you can sell it. And I learned a little technique that I've tried to use over the years. It was very beneficial to me in my sales life. I've managed to more than pay the rent. It's also, I think, helped me in my personal interaction with people, my social personal interaction. And I call it training the conversation. And we're all going to leave here in a little while, and we're going to go out, and this is the way it's going to go a little bit. We're going to walk up to somebody and say, hey, how's it going? And they're going to say something to us like, oh, it's going good. And I went up to see the kids for the weekend. We bought a new house. I, uh, I put an addition. Uh, I got a new car. Son's doing time. Whatever it may be. <laughs> and I'm going to offer you a suggestion. When somebody talks to you like that next time and offers you some information that they're doing, don't say a thing. Wait three seconds and look them in the eye. The first thing that's going to happen is they're probably going to be in shock and awe that you're actually listening to them, okay? But it's a very sincere form of flattery if you do it. Second thing you do at that time and in those three seconds is you refocus your response, which was typically going to be, oh, yeah, back and say, I'm not going to respond with something I did. I'm going to come back, and I'm going to come back with a question. I'm going to come back and ask you a question about what you just told me. Okay? Well, how old are the grandchildren? What kind of car did you buy? What kind of addition are you putting on your house? When did your son get out? Whatever. You know? And I promise, if you do that, you don't have to do it every time. You'd go nuts trying. But the more you can do that, you'll be shocked at how you can develop a better relationship with people. They'll feel more comfortable with you. And you know what? Just like I told the kids, you're going to learn things about them, things you didn't know. And it's a great learning experience. So let me kind of bring this to closure because, you know, how does it all relate to what's in here, both on our affirmation and on the back page? If we spend all the time loving ourselves, we can't spend all the time loving somebody else. So therefore, maybe we want to spend less time on ourselves and more time on others. If we truly want to walk the walk and talk the talk that we have in here and the reason we're here and be the compassionate people we truly ascribe to be, then think less about you and more about them. Thank you.